Alright, good afternoon everyone. I am uh, pleased to welcome you all to this panel, Future Proofing India's Food System through Smart Protein. I am Sneha Singh, I am your moderator for this afternoon. I lead the Good Food Institute India. GFI India is the central expert think tank on smart protein working across policy, science and business, helping to accelerate the transition towards a more sustainable um, food system through smart protein. We facilitate connections, we bring data-driven intelligence and champion research and development and policy advancement for smart proteins. As we gather here today at World Food India to witness the growing prowess of the food processing sector, it's really important for us to have a vision for India's food system. India's population is rapidly expanding and environmental challenges are mounting simultaneously. There is therefore an increasing need for innovative solutions that ensure food security whilst addressing the global concern of food production. Smart proteins include plant-based protein sources and microbial proteins derived from biomass fermentation have immense potential to be a solution for the future. These are emerging technologies that diversify our protein sources and promise to reduce the growing environmental impact that comes with conventional food systems. Through these alternatives, India has the opportunity to lead the way towards a better food future. In today's session, we are joined by some very eminent experts. Uh, we'll focus on the infrastructure needs for India's smart protein sector as we aim to be a global leader in this space. With that, I'd like to invite our esteemed panelists who will dive deeper into these topics and share their insights on how India can drive this movement forward. Um, I'll start with Dr. Harinder Obroji, uh, Director of IFTIP. Dr. Manish Chukla from Reliance. Mr. Anand Subramaniam from Paul. Suraj Nayar from Ankur Capital. And Sarthak Singhal from Zindi Industries Capital. Just a quick disclaimer as we start this session, uh, please ensure your phones are on silent or turned off so that we can have a meaningful engaged discussion today. Thank you all. I'm just going to check. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to talk about smart protein and future-proofing India's food system. Uh, this stage has uh, limited ability for eye contact, and I hope that's okay. Uh, we will all try and have a, a, a discussion so that everybody can hear us out loud. It's getting quite crowded. Uh, please settle down. Thank you. Um, Dr. Obro, I'd like to start off with you. You're at the forefront of food technology with Niftim. Could you tell us about smart proteins, particularly plant-based proteins, um, single-cell proteins, and their role in India's food system priorities? Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, smart proteins are as smart as the name is. Uh, I, uh, if you look at uh, the single-cell proteins, there's a company called ICL which started it way back, I think it was somewhere in nine, early 19, 1927, 19, I don't remember the exact day. Uh, microbial proteins are there uh, for quite some time. There, there, have been, there have been certain issues uh, and that is the reason why the company could not really take it, take it to a scale where it was desired. One of the reasons was because it has more of RNA content which leads to the problem of gout and uh, some other uh, disorders. And then they also found certain problems as to the scale up of uh, the single cell proteins were concerned. Was concerned. Well, I think we have, uh, over a period of time, technological advancements have been there. Science has really uh, searched ahead. And now we have uh, much better bioreactors. But I would still say, since we are addressing people from industry and uh, academia and uh, I'm sure there must be a few startups and entrepreneurs too. 
there is a need to develop solid state power reactors. So to make proteins more smarter, we need to have smart reactors. Uh, that too, which are cost effective, which ideally adapt to the right uh, heat mass uh, balance conditions. Uh, and then, uh, we already have products like Tempe, we already have products like Dabadova in Africa, which are produced from uh, through solid state fermentation. When it comes specifically to proteins, I think plants are the best sources to have the smart proteins. I would rather want smart proteins to be smart foods. If smart proteins integrated along with the smart fiber, it can really result into something which can be incorporated into the foods and we have a complete mix of the carbohydrates, proteins, fats, minerals, vitamins that we need. So uh, everybody knows about soya bean, everybody knows about fava beans, everybody knows about a lot of other sources. But something which, you know, I was talking to some of the startups when I was involved, I was chairing a session on uh, Grand Challenge. I hope you're all there yesterday when you saw this grand startup, the youngsters getting awards for the Grand Challenge uh, system, which we have already initiated in the ministry. One of the guys came out with a very good idea of, you know, extracting protein out of analysis. So I suggested him, like, you know, and he was also targeting a few other grasses. So not that all the grasses go in for the cattle field. So there's a chance to, and India being you know, a diverse country as far as the flora and fauna is concerned, if you go to North East, there's so much of diversity. If you can even use 10% of the, 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 the flora we have in that region for extracting proteins and making them, you know, bringing them to edible form. If you look at amaranthus, if you look at uh, Bacilla, July, what we call, if you look at Genopodium, these are all traditionally grown uh, vegetables which do not require much, they don't require any pesticide, they don't require fertilizer, they grow on their own. And the sourcing becomes much simpler. And these are largely grown in tribal areas and not much, uh, not in a cultivated area. So I think uh, it has a huge potential. And uh, we have, uh, we just at the tip of the iceberg, we need to move further and take this area, uh, ensure that we make long strides and bring it back into a system where everybody realizes the potential of that. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Roy. Um, as you said, we're talking to industry over here. I, I'd love to get your views as well. Dr. Shukla, could you share with us and the audience over here your journey in, uh, at Reliance in setting up a large-scale example when it comes to an innovative circular economy approach when it comes to a manufacturing algal protein. You know, it's been very interesting what you've done so far and I'm sure the audience would be wanting to hear more. Sure. Um, thanks, Neha, for organizing and for the organizers, thank you for uh, giving an opportunity to create more awareness, uh, more on the, uh, the real uh, issues around uh, alternate protein. And as an industry and as Reliance, uh, we are very much keeping a track on this uh, trend of alternate proteins. And that's where we uh, uh, took a pivoting uh, of our algae technology that we have proven, scaled up over the years, and trying to bring it to alternate proteins. And that's what I would like to talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but before that, I'll talk about algae. So algae, as we are aware, uh, it's unicellular, it's multicellular. What we are trying to do is use a unicellular algae, take it, take it and grow it in seawater, use greenhouse gases, use completely you know, barren land we can have. So you can imagine the kind of sustainable score you're going to give. You bring it to this kind of manufacturing. That being said, that's the, the first part, that's the strategizing part, that's the thought process, right? in terms of economics, in terms of sustainability, in terms of what you deliver. But then comes the more difficult part is around the scalability, cultivation of it. And that's where the challenges are in our past uh, uh, more than a decade. What we are trying to do is overcome uh, the cultivation of herders. I'll be talking a little more later, but that's what we are trying to do. And bring it to a stage where we can bring it as a food and you know, from this we can get even materials, some things we can target it to new sustainable materials as well. So, uh, so that being said, 
uh, coming to uh, the overall process, we are trying to do a biorefinery. So we are trying to use every molecule of the, the biomass we are creating. As today, it's a biomass which is costly, so we want to use every bit of it. And in doing so, the protein that we get out is a very, very interesting protein. And as uh, Dr. Oberai said, we are looking at the whole uh, leaf space, right? If I may say, leaves, grass. This has a very interesting rubisco component, and we are aware that rubisco is a very interesting protein, rich in all essential amino acids. When we take algae also, this algae protein also is very similar in its constitution to leaf proteins. That's where we, we see that we can leverage more of this rubisco and take it as a nutrition forward. Apart from that, the, the essential amino acids, the pigments, what we have also done is by our processing, we have improved digestibility. So, but then it's still not there to meet uh, with the conventional ways and you know peas and soyas of the world. So we are trying to move it forward and try to take that forward. So that's what I would like to talk. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Shukla. I'll move on to uh, Sarthak. Uh, Sarthak, you've been in uh, this space long before uh, just the plant-based protein um, aspect of it picked up as a legacy manufacturer. Um, could you tell us about the market opportunity that Zippy saw in this space and what factors prompted you to set up a facility that serves this market? Thanks for the opportunity, GFI. Uh, so, uh, in right before COVID, Zippy had established a couple of... Uh, so, we are a uh, pasta manufacturer. We had expanded into a couple other product lines, which also included multigrain pasta, gluten-free pasta, and then also fortified rice kernels. So we uh, started like seeing ourselves more as a health food company rather than just a pasta company. So uh, within that vision, we were looking to expand the products that we could we could do. At that time, plant-based meat globally was a huge trend, and uh, uh, within that space, we were we we saw that uh, the companies in India and even globally they were not they were saying that we are not competitive with uh, chicken. Even red meat, which is generally more expensive, which uh, to me didn't make a lot of sense because when you look at the protein per gram of plant-based of plant proteins, let's say soya protein or even wheat gluten for that matter, it's much cheaper than what you get from animal sources. Uh, so we did a basic survey of the field. We saw that uh, there's a new technology uh, called high moisture extrusion that was coming up. Uh, we had a lot of expertise in extrusion because of uh, our experience in pasta industry. So we thought that uh, let, uh, we, we thought that this might be something we could look at. Then uh, there was a lot of hesitance in the sense that uh, people would say that would there be acceptance for these sort of products. Uh, so we uh, looked at the Indian market uh, primarily, not at the export market, and we saw that uh, there's a, for example, soya chaat is indirectly serving as textured protein, so it's a proxy for uh, uh, the meat or novel texture acceptance in India. So we started seeing it as more of a textured protein space uh, rather than just a plant-based meat thing. And uh, so and we were fairly confident that if we really invested our R&D efforts into this field, that we could uh, do a good, uh, a really good product because uh, we had experience where we are competing with uh, Italian products, even American products in the pasta space. So uh, I think the Indian companies can innovate quite a bit if they put their minds to it. The cost of innovation is also kind of low in India. So we moved ahead with the project and uh, now we are at a place where we are less than half the cost of chicken for most of our high moisture excluded products. That's very interesting and how's, uh, how's that journey been bringing it down to half the cost of chicken? I mean I'm sure most people in the room probably didn't know that. So. Uh, it's been, uh, like when I say half the cost of chicken, it's just at the extrusion level, then there's a value-added component. Uh, also depends on what you consider the price of chicken to be and which part of chicken you are comparing yourself against. Uh, so, uh, but I think we are uh, we are there and it's been a journey where you just start thinking from, let's say first principle, you just think in, let's say terms of protein per gram, rather than, uh, so uh, a lot of times you have to use 
uh, maybe the lower functional proteins and somehow make them functional through processing rather than relying on uh, highly functional proteins which might be easier to work with but the cost uh, is not uh, justified uh, if you want to actually achieve that. So it uh, depends on the objectives for us, the cost factor was very important so we focused on more commodity raw materials. Okay, I think that's working now. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sartak. And you were talking about functionality. I'd, I'd love to go to Anand uh, on functionality because Paul has been actively supporting companies in the plant-based protein sector in India. Can you tell us how Paul's technologies, Anand, are helping companies create functional, high-quality plant protein ingredients? Yeah, sure, Sneha. First of all, thank you to Lofty and GFI for giving me this opportunity. So I, as Neha mentioned, I represent Paul Corporation. We are into uh, filtration. Paul has a legacy of you know, 75 years of legacy in you know, filtration solutions and, uh, and, and focusing not only solving customer challenges, but also providing sustainable solutions. Right? And uh, as we gather today, we, we acknowledge the relevance of protein, the growth of protein in India. Now, to give some amount of statistics here in terms of the current market value today uh, for protein India is anywhere between four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars. You know, uh, uh, that's what that's about uh, market scenario. Now, what we are seeing as a market trend is you know we are going to grow by one point two billion dollars by twenty thirty. You know, that's a that's a huge growth. Now, when we say about the value, you know, the value of that is about the quality of the protein we are able to manufacture, right? You know, 1.2 billion just doesn't come like that. You know, we have to produce high quality protein, uh, you know, and make it more affordable. Now, one of the challenges in this process is in terms of, you know, how can we produce high functional proteins? And manufacturing process plays a larger role in, in terms of producing. What is high functional protein and how do we make it sustainably? Now, if you, uh, I see a lot of students here, and you saw that, yeah, and, and a lot of you know manufacturers here. The conventional technology what we use today has got multiple steps: chemical precipitation or thermal process, followed by centrifugation. There is a high chance of protein denaturation. Number one, and number two, high possibility of bio and carryover. Right? Both of them are not desirable in terms of you know producing high quality protein. Now, there need to be a shift in this manufacturing process. You know, Paul can provide, you know, uh, cross-flow filtration, cross-flow, you know, microfiltration, which can produce protein isolates, you know, which you can further concentrate with an UF or NF technology, and it becomes much easier for your spray drying as well. Now, when we do that, you know, it's not only one specific protein in this process, you can isolate multiple proteins, you know, it could be protein, albumin, or multiple components can be uh, processed with this technology, unlike a conventional technology, right? So that's the that's a benefit we can offer here. Now, I would like to call upon a couple of examples where we have been very successful at a global level. One is for a global beer manufacturer called ABA InBev, right? Most of you, if you are drinking beer, of course, you know, you, you, you can connect to that. ABA InBev, you know, one of the byproducts in the process is a spent grain, right? And we, we work closely with ABA InBev to set up a cross flow filtration to produce protein isolates, you know, which they are, you know, using it for human consumption in beverages. So that is one example. The other example, for last 10 years, we are working with a protein starch manufacturer to produce, you know, egg-like protein uh, from, you know, whatever, whatever they process protocol after that, whatever is spent, you know, we are using our, they are using our technology to produce high quality protein which mimics egg. So, you know, that, that's what we can bring to, you know, the table in terms of the technology, what we can offer. And, and it's a joint collaboration between not only by us, but, but you know, the academia and the manufacturers uh, like all of you here. No, absolutely. And I think I'll come to the valorization piece in a bit. That's very interesting. We'll talk about side streams a bit more. Uh, but before that, I'd, I want to talk about infrastructure, which is one of the the themes of, of the conversation today. Um, Suraj, at Ankur Capital, you've got a portfolio that has uh, invested in deep tech. There's been smart protein investments also as a part of that portfolio. Um, could you tell us what kind of infrastructure is needed when it comes to commercial manufacturing of plant-based and single cell proteins and the scale at which this is required? 
Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Neha. Um, thanks for the opportunity uh, to speak here. And uh, I think uh, to answer your question, I think we have probably a couple of companies where uh, you know we have invested in uh, you know, technologies which are uh, trying to develop alternate ways of, of producing protein, right? Um, and I think the the challenge that we face is, is two fronts. Right? These the challenge that these companies have faced is actually two fronts. One is so when you when you develop something in the lab, right? Uh, it's, it's it's at a very very small scale, and uh, we've understood one, one thing about biology, which we've understood is the fact that uh, it's it's never linearly scalable, right? So you gotta really validate at different scales, right? Um, so one of the challenges in infrastructure in India today is the fact that there, there's very less pilot facilities that are available, right? So go around around the country and and uh, see if, if there are like I don't know, 500 liters, 1,000 liter fermenters available for startups to actually just rent out and then do pilots. That's just that's just very uh, it's just not there, right? Most of the incubators in India uh, that you see uh, lack that facility to have a facility for like a 500 liter, 1,000 liter pilot, uh, you know, uh, facility. Uh, so that's like point number one. And I think you know we recently came across the biomanufacturing, uh, you know, the uh, policy that's come out, which is primarily trying to address this this challenge, right, of, of getting the uh, pilot facilities up and running across the country so that startups who mature from the lab stage can go on to use these facilities uh, for their pilot uh, studies. That's one. Second, obviously when it comes to protein, I think the scale that we're talking about here is huge, right? So one of our companies is, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of scaled to a certain extent, but we're still talking about single digit market penetrations. Right, when it comes to uh, you know producing these novel types of proteins, right? So take like overall you know protein consumption across the world, and there's a certain way in which that, that protein is produced versus the, these new technologies. We're still talking about uh, single-digit penetrations, right? Even at the scales that we've reached until now. So talking about humongous scales that that we need to achieve, and so that requires a very different. First of all, that requires like capabilities to be able to scale that. And second is obviously the funding infrastructure to sort of support that, right? And I'm not just talking about uh, venture capital funding, I'm talking about just all other uh, types of asset classes also to sort of come in, which includes government support, debt funding, any type of uh, funding that's required to uh, set up manufacturing facilities. There's a definite need for that to happen if if we have to reach price parities for these alternate technologies, right? So that's the scale that we're talking about here. No, absolutely, and I'm glad you touched on the different instruments. We'll go deeper into that uh, as we go uh, further into the conversation. The policy has been very encouraging. I think looking ahead with the Bio E3 policy and how government can play a role in understanding this infrastructure challenge, like taking it to scale, and what are the opportunities that uh, collaborators can come together, different stakeholders can come together, avail that, and then which exactly what you're saying is a challenge here. Um, I think coming back to economic viability, Dr. Shukla, I'd like to come back to you. I think uh, there's when there is a sector as nascent as smart protein, I think there's challenges, there's opportunities. And this section of the conversation, I'd love to touch upon both with all of the panelists to some degree. Um, coming to Reliance, you've been working to develop an economically viable algal protein production, which is a very ambitious goal. I know you said a little bit about that at the start. What do you think are the key challenges that you're facing to bring the solution to market and how can these be overcome in the industry at large so that it can be propelled ahead? Sure. Uh, just before I go into the uh, scale issues and aspects, I would just um, add to Suraj's aspect of economics. And um, you know, in some sectors, uh, carbon credit systems have been uh, you know up and coming, and then there is incentivizing. So I always feel that uh, the government should look at uh, the alternate proteins also from that view, and see the relevant ministries, ministries of forest environment and power or the relevant ones can see that if they can see and facilitate, there will be more economic interest uh, from an investor point of view and things like that. So coming back to uh, the reliance and uh, uh, the processing part and uh, the, the scale part, uh, every technology has to face the 
so-called Death Valley, where all the technologies go through a very hard time. That happens with algae as well. <coughs> uh, we did some excellent work with small scale labs and on ponds and some acres. Now if I have to look for a, a protein which is going for in a food system, I would at least start with the next scale of maybe thousands of acres, something like that. So uh, that's where uh, we, uh, you know, we have to decide where our end game is, what we want to deliver, how, what will the process, the, the whole, the operations around it. And uh, from that, coming back, as I said, cultivation of algae in itself is a challenge. Over the years we have done it, but it's still not over. It's, it's like what agriculture was 5,000 years ago is what cultivation of algae is today. So still learning, still improving, there's a long way to go. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the, the, the process aspects, I'll first finish with algae and then I come to others. So the process aspects of it has been facilitated with uh, companies like uh, Paul who are helping us with certain things to you know see that the skills are possible, we give a the right protein that matches, um, you know, the conventional protein alternates. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so that being said, a lot of improvement is still there for a protein coming from algae. It has to be modified to bring the the, the taste and all the criteria to be at par, and the price. So, price somehow scales can manage, but a lot of downstream development will still be required to make it uh, available. At the same time, um, um, what we are also, when we look at other platforms, the bacterial platforms, as um, Asur has also mentioned, that there will be scale uh, dependencies, uncertainties that will be there. You have to go there to see and prove and things like that. And that's what uh, we are trying to do. I mean, in Reliance, uh, uh, we, we have a very, you know, set of very, very expert chemical engineers. The manufacturing is very different than biological. So there will be a little different set of uncertainties. So that has to be addressed then. And for that we need the kind of infrastructure, things around. I, I think, and also the, the tie-ups with bio-incubators, common instrumentation facilities, I know we were spoke, speaking about that earlier as well. Um, that's a huge play when it comes to trying to uh, bring it to scale, commercial manufacturing. Um, Sarthak, I'd like to come back to you. I know, uh, as I said at the start of this panel, eye contact is slightly difficult <laughs> given the setup of the stage. But uh, you've had, as I was saying, like success, you were talking about the successes that you've had when it comes to uh, plant-based protein. What about the challenges that you faced? Uh, Dr. Shukla said that every uh, Every sector has to go through a valley of death to some point and then come to the other side. Uh, and, I, and we know that there's been challenges in plant-based proteins as well, plant-based meat as well. Um, what have those challenges been for you um, in terms of scaling up commercial manufacturing? Yeah, so I think uh, probably one of the biggest challenges is psychological because people have a lot of resistance to do new things and uh, there were a lot of... Uh, negativity, I should say, regarding plant-based uh, proteins and meats, uh, probably about two years back. I think it's been deciding now. Uh, other than that, like more uh, from the, so uh, when we started the scale up for the plant, we uh, we didn't have any facility for high moisture extrusion that we could depend on and do a lot of trials uh, on. So we did some uh, trials with the machine we had bought from Germany. That was fairly expensive, so we could not do it uh, multiple times and then uh, we had to wait for the machine to come to India to continue our uh, R&D on the actual machine. So that took us more than six months to uh, get to an acceptable level of product. So R&D doesn't stop but at least you have a threshold where the product is acceptable uh, by a target audience. So that, that was a lot of work and a uh, lot of uncertainty. So you have to proceed through that uncertainty without knowing whether or not you will be able to create a product. So uh, we actually uh, set up the factory and then we uh, were able to establish the product because we did not see a good line of sight in establishing the product without a facility. Uh, so that was uh, one of the biggest challenge. Now that we have that, uh, the biggest challenge is uh, more on the supply chain side, uh, like uh, we get orders if we are 
we have kind we are highly dependent on uh, some specialty raw materials which are imported and uh, so since the projections are like at the end of the day they are projections so you can't depend on them and uh, if we see significant demand increase we can't fulfill the orders timely so right now actually one of the biggest reasons why are why we are not able to scale as fast as we could is probably the supply chain constraint on the ingredient side. Um, there's also constraint on the supply side. So we are into frozen cold chain. Uh, we have we have availed a scheme from MOCP. Uh, so the issue is that in cold chain, uh, you have to get to a certain scale before the logistics becomes feasible. Uh, so you know it's like you can bring everything, every cost downward if logistics is very expensive, then it doesn't really matter. So uh, at the end of the day, you have to achieve scale uh, for the raw material predictability and stocking. And uh, so you have to have a good inventory control in place, as well as you have to get to a scale where your uh, frozen logistics starts making a lot of sense. So uh, yeah, so it's been it's been a journey. I think it's, we'll have more like different kinds of challenges as we go through different stages. How uh, Mr. Uh, uh, so how, uh, about. Um, so, yeah, that's side. Um, I think from a, uh, you spoke about the challenges that's been very useful. I think sharing uh, what Dr. Shukla was also saying that there are different challenges when it comes to new technology. Uh, I feel that's where having uh, support from the government when it comes to A, finding innovative R&D uh, and also on the scale up side is, is what we are trying to talk about today. Um, it's very, um, I think, encouraging to know that there are schemes from the government like the one that you availed, whether it's from the MOFPI schemes. I know that there is so much interest and enthusiasm from the Ministry of Science also to look into the sector. Um, and that kind of interest, the positive signaling, is great for industry to take that leap of faith ahead and say that, yes, we can go ahead, we can do this. Um, changing gears towards technology in that vein, um, Suraj, I'll come to you. In your experience, what do you think are the critical technological challenges that especially fermentation-based startups have faced? Um, and what have you felt are the right investments that can bring in that scaling up of production element? Um, that we've been all talking about the scale up side, but your experience on the fermentation side. So, see, I think uh, what you're solving for is is uh, are two things, right? One is uh, to get the uh, the right kind of protein, uh, and second is to hit the right price points. So, you're solving basically solving for these two uh, you know challenges. So any technology that, that comes up has to try and find ways to uh, get to the right, uh, right price points and get to the right kind of protein with the, the correct PDCAS score, right? Uh, that's what you're trying to aim at. So biomass fermentation, I mean, in our experience, I think uh, obviously working with microbes is a bit of a challenge because, uh, you know, microbes want to work in their own way. And uh, you know what? What we've seen uh, startups do is basically try to figure out a way in which you can enhance the production of uh, very specific types of proteins that you would want. Right? That's what actually single cell protein is all about. You you figure out strategies. You learn uh, the the pathways in the in the bacteria, uh, which and then work on those to make sure that you know you are uh, being able to produce the, the desired protein in, in in the concentrations that would require. So concentrations and price points go hand in hand. Uh, higher the concentrations, higher the productivities, the lower the costs. Um, so I think uh, we've seen multiple technologies, right? So one of our company, uh, you know, uh, String Bio is, is is looking at developing, uh, you know, single cell proteins for various applications, right? So and they have a very interesting adaptive evolution kind of a uh, you know uh, process through which they've been able to over a period of time. Obviously, it takes time, but you know, being able to produce the desired kind of proteins. Uh, for various applications, so going all the way from animal animal feed all the way up to human consumption as well. So, I mean, these are strategies where you basically, uh, you know, work with the microbes over a period of time and make them, uh, you know, produce a desired protein. So, that I think across the world, you know, in, in the world of uh, biotechnology, I think we've seen a lot of work happen uh, uh, on that, right? Um, so, obviously the challenge is to get to the right kind of amino acid profiles that you would want. 
Um, I think uh, one of the challenges that we've seen with plant proteins is the fact that the PDK score generally is a, is a concern uh, when you try to compare it with uh, you know animal-based uh, uh, meat, uh, animal-based proteins. So I think biomass fermentation does provide some sort of a uh, you know middle ground over there. Uh, I would say. Um, so that's one, and obviously we've seen like other uh, you know other types of direct uh, biomass consumption as well. And mycoprotein is one example over there. And you're basically talking about fungal fermentation and that final biomass itself is, is like the final product that you're talking about. Um, cultivated meat to me is a, is a long game. I think uh, you know that, that has a different set of challenges. We've, I don't think that's like the point of uh, conversation today. But, uh, but I think uh, there is a lot of work to be done on the biomass fermentation sites very specifically. Uh, you know, just on the technology piece itself. Uh, and I would say scale up is a different challenge altogether. I think one of the key uh, challenges to get proteins at price at the right price points. Obviously, fermentation and process development is one piece of it, but downstream is the other aspect. Most of the downstream, uh, you know, setup today that we have in India processes are all catered for the pharmaceutical industry, right? And you talk about filtration, you talk about, you know, uh, all of that is very uh, costly, right? That's required for the kind of, uh, you know, uh, purities that we desire for a pharmaceutical uh, product. And so, you know, all, all the process, everything is catered for that. So it's, I, I do feel there is innovation required on the downstream side as well. Uh, one of the things that I was reading up. I don't think the, I don't think we're going to answer all the questions today, but even knowing what are these kind of challenges, what are the white spaces for innovation, so that we can take away, go back, think about these. I'm sure there's people in the room, there's people on the panel who, who want to know what the white spaces are so that they can put, put their brains together and, and look ahead towards solving for these challenges. Um, I also on, on a side note, uh, just one point that I want to mention is that one of the things that uh, actually all the first generation plant-based companies have faced is the organoleptic properties of, of these products and I think there's very less focus on, on fats as as a as a component of, of this whole piece. I think proteins is something that's that's been there's a lot of focus on that. But I think we've seen we've seen globally also a few companies now trying to produce the fats uh, you know in other ways so that, that can uh, complement the protein products, the first generation protein products. I think that's also another area where there's Absolutely. some work that's required. Absolutely because that's where the taste parity piece comes in. If you are looking at these products and, and for them to biomimic conventional meat products, the gaps are now being, after the first generation has happened of these products, the gaps are now apparent of what those organoleptic properties are. And now the second wave of uh, innovation is happening to fill for those white spaces. Now, example is that, uh, you know, what is the uh, dietary guideline for smart protein? Can we have a policy around that? Can we have a regulation around the unifying the quality of the protein? Can we have some guidelines around that? Uh, so those are some of those you know key uh, definitions or milestones, you know, which which has to happen between uh, government as well as the you know private players uh, uh, in, in together to define uh, what we want to become, right? So that's a starting point. Uh, then comes, I'll focus on the midstream, what I mentioned in terms of the processing or manufacturing. The processing is highly capex intensive, no doubt about that, right, you know, highly capex intensive. <coughs> now, when it comes to the consideration of the processing, as a manufacturer, what we should be looking at is in terms of, you know, are we only myopic about the initial investment or are, are we looking long term? If you are, if you, if you want to set up a plan with a, low capex investment to begin with, you know, it comes with its own challenges during a scale-up phase, right? You, know, you have limitations in terms of how you want to scale up. So have a balanced outlook, you know, work with the experts and see that, you know, what is the right approach in terms of that capital investment there, right? Now, one, the conventional technology, pro probably you will set up a plan, you know, which will give only one product. You go for uh, an advanced technology like a filtration, you know, one setup or one set of equipment will give you multiple products. So you look at that cost-benefit analysis and you know get there. The other aspect, you know, uh, we need to we need to come out of the mindset that you know, smart protein in India we want to start from ground zero. No, there are enough opportunities available. You know, I'll, I'll again uh, my favorite example of beer is that 
India as a country, you know, we drink around 7 billion liters of beer every year. And, and from that process, 3,500 tons of spent grain is generated as a waste. Can you imagine, what do we do with that? Half of that goes into landfill. Half of that goes into cattle feed. Right? There is an opportunity available for you. You know, there should be a mindset of forward integration in terms of setting up that infrastructure and, you know, wisely use that available raw material and, and you, know, you know, manufacture something out of that. Right? So, so that's, it's a combination of, there are challenges, of course, yes, from an infrastructure point of view. There are challenges, but I would like to, you know, summarize in terms of, you know, number one, what is that we want to define as a smart protein sector in India? It could be, you know, plant-based and fermentation-based or, you know, uh, animal-based, whatever it is. Uh, animal meat, I said, not animal based. Uh, and second is in terms of, you know, what are the key milestones, uh, what we want to achieve. And we have done, you know, during COVID, you know, within six, seven months as a country, we have come up successfully with a vaccine. So there is, there is capability and, you know, uh, possibilities, immense possibilities within, within this country. No, I fully agree. And I think time and again in the different interactions that we've been at, we've seen people talk about India's resilience and capacity, what we saw in COVID and how we turned it around for a huge population. It's pretty tremendous what as a country we were able to do when the right levers are pushed and the right people come into uh, action almost. You spoke about side streams and valorization and I think that's a very untapped opportunity in India right now when it comes to this sector specifically, when it comes to smart protein. And we have an expert here who's worked so much on the side stream side. Uh, Dr. Obra, you've got immense uh, uh, experience uh, turning commodity crop side streams and agri-food waste uh, into proteins. It's a promising strategy. We see the potential. You're very familiar uh, on the fermentation side of things, how this works. What main challenges do you see, sir, when it comes to scaling up of the use of these side streams for the production of uh, single-cell proteins at scale? I think before I come to uh, asking your question, I would just like to reflect upon what has been discussed by your brothers and panelists. Uh, I totally agree with uh, Suraj when he says, we work only towards upstream, we forget about the downstream. That is what happened in a bioethanol process also. So, whenever we talked about ethanol production with the lipid cell music based, we only talked about getting alcohol concentration of 3.44% and concentrating it. But nobody talked about biomass logistics, nobody talked about the, you can take the alcohol to about 95% through distillation. But the real challenge is how to make it 99.8%. That is where required either, either the, the membrane filtration methods, the molecular sieves, and or you have to go through the azotropic distillation process. Now both these processes have got a lot of cost attached to it. So uh, I think we have to look at a very holistic approach rather than jumping the gun and saying that only you need to produce this much. Second thing is when I talk about infrastructure, again I will come back to like Nifton has pilot plants. We do have pilot plants which operate at scale of about 1 to 1.2 French tons per day, but they are not for fermentation. I have a spray dryer which has a capacity of about 200 liters input capacity. I am ready to invest and put up a ferment roll because we've got incubators. We got startups who are interested in having the you know deriving the benefits of fermentation. But then the problem here, Suraj, would be because all these startups normally work at about three liters, five liters, ten liters, and directly going to one ton, a thousand liters again will be poor. So you need something which scales it up to about say about 250 liters and then we go to the thousand liters. So we are in a, we, we are in a process to set up this uh, the scale up kind of you know uh, a system where we have small fermenter, a medium fermenter and then basically a large fermenter. In fact large fermenter if you say I will go to Grand Max here you know where we had about you know 10,000 liter fermenters and when this work we did not previous we had about 250,000 liter fermenters. I am not touching uh, we are not going to we are not thinking about those levels. But then only you'll be able to optimize the process. If you start scaling up from 5 liters to 5, 500 liters or 1,000 liters, you're going to uh, no, run into problems, for sure. So coming to your point of the side stream, one best example that comes to my mind is tomato processing. Now, uh, I was talking to the managing director of Kremika, and even uh, yesterday I was with Mr. Vilash Shinde, who does a lot of work for 
Kisan and other companies, they, they supply the tomato paste to them. About 4 to 5 percent is the tomato waste, which has the peels, which has a little bit of seeds also crushed into it. You have lycopene, which is, a very, which is a bioactive compound, which is available in the tomato peels and seeds. You have a seed protein, then you have a seed oil. And, that, and we have plants which process about close to 150 tons per day. So even if they run for two months in a year, see the amount of residue that we derive from them. If we, so I was telling him that can we not work on you know, having technologies which are separate because I remember when I was in Bangalore, somebody asked me, can you get me protein from the tomato seeds? Because that has a very good application because of specific mineral acid in pharma. So if we can plug these gaps, now the main thing here is industry and academy have to come together. Now we are all working in isolation. And startups feel, you know, and I was telling my startups yesterday whom we have incubated, whom we could incubate, whom we had uh, given those grandchildren to awards. Not rush for money. Don't only talk about valuations. There are a lot of other things. Have a firm footing first. Money will just flow through. So I think it's, it's time that we, uh, startups have ideas. We have the place for them to incubate. Give them technological backstopping, backstopping technologically and then link them to the market. So I think tomato is a very good way. And secondly, let me come down to now uh, rice straw. Parali has been a very big problem. When I was in Ludhiana, we were working with IIT Delhi and GUT Amritsar, wherein uh, uh, Anand's membranes will come into a picture for a while. I hope I have time. Uh, when you, when you uh, do the acid hydrolysis for rice straw, rice straw, you get a lot of compounds, you get a lot of fun sugars. Of course, I'm not talking about proteins here. I'm just trying to give an example, maybe an analogy for proteins at a later stage. And though somebody said that we just want glucose to ferment and to throw because the fructose is not fermented by, uh, uh, sorry, but the hex, the, the, hex, you know, the pentose sugars are not getting fermented by the yeast that we have. So through, uh, you know, uh, membrane filtration, we could even separate glucose from those uh, pentose sugars. <coughs> So there, if there is a will to do something, you know, technologies are there, they have to put in the right perspective and uh, uh, we can do wonders with that. I gave an example of uh, now the millets. Millet protein isolates, I would say they are, uh, though we don't have a big market for them, when we use those millet protein isolates in the bread that we make, we could get bread with about 12% protein and a very good texture and palatability. We have given the samples to industry. I think that, as I said, I mean, when you talk about supply chain, uh, effective, though, though I'm not from industry, but effective supply chains are those which are processing a variety of raw materials. If, uh, if you set up a mango processing plant in South India, that will work only for two months in a year. But then if you have a multi-processing, multiple uh, commodity processing plants, you can attain the economic feasibility that you need. Similarly, as I said, if we have to really harness the potential of plant proteins, let's think about the, the Batuas, let's think about the Julais, and let's think about the faba beans or soya beans. I remember whenever, you know, in yesterday years, when you go to a shop, to a sabjiwala, to buy a mustard, saag. So this saag ke saag batu free milega kya? So you used to get it free. So that has a value, but that is easily available. So I think the, the cost of raw material also has, a, has got a big role to play. I feel that side streams plus these streams which are not been, which have not been tapped very very important for the protein industry. And similarly, you now uh, if, you, if you go back to, you know, there there are systems in place, and what we have not actually thought about is, is as you rightly said, that the palatability of the product. So that is a challenge which you in the minute products face. At the, at the last bite, you feel that bitterness. The palatability is not there. And I was in you know, uh, DD News today, and that is what the question that was posed to me was about. Why millets, though there is so much of, you know, gongo about millets, they are not getting that popular that they should be. You know, getting them from the side of the plate to the middle of the plate. So I think that is, we, we need to work together to find technological solution. And one more thing, uh, we'll talk about biomass valorization. A very good point, very interesting point brought out was about the, 
the, the brewer's spent grain. And I would again, you know, I was talking to uh, industry in uh, Nagpur where they have a lot of DDGs, that uh, dry industrial grain also. So if we can, I have worked in that breweries and I know that uh, through the lottery time we used to have tons of uh, spring grain just going as a waste, as a landfill, or there were a few dairy farmers to take it. And again, you know, because of the moisture content, until unless you dry it to a certain level, there is a lot of uh, fungal infestation in that. So these are the sources for where we can derive very high value protein. And the other thing is the oil cakes. The coconut oil cake, we are going to work with Mariko now, uh, or the cotton seed the meal that we get. They have good amount of fat, they have good amount of uh, protein in that. And I'm not saying that we have to drill every day, you know, we have to extract entire protein and all out of it because we have uh, cattle to serve also. We need uh, milk. But some amount of protein, suppose, you know, if you, if you uh, just to give an example, if you crush uh, mustard seeds through the, the normal traditional process of expulsion, you, there's about 8% oil which, which, uh, which remains in the cake. And if I am able to take about 5% of that and further see that 3% is still retained in the cake, I can do that. So similarly in uh, coconut oil meal, the cotton seed oil meal, after little refining, pre-processing, if we are able to, uh, that is where we have, we have like to work with the Food Food Institute. In fact, we submitted a proposal also for a collaborative work where we can derive proteins out of that and then do the functional studies of those proteins. Talk, uh, you know, run through the, the, the protein solubility, all the other essays which are required to make proteins amenable, desirable and palatable and then develop products out of it. So there is a huge amount of you know, potential if industry, academy or startups they all come together. No, absolutely and I think we will come to the consortia style work which is so critical for a new sector like this um, in, in a few minutes as well. And that brings us to the looking ahead piece of this conversation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Obroy, for nudging us uh, that way. I think we've spoken about opportunities and challenges in the space, but uh, a lot of the conversation sometimes is not action-based. So uh, the next, hopefully, segment of this conversation will try and we can't answer all the questions today, as I said, but I think even some ideas that we've already seen emerge in this conversation and how can some tractable outcomes be identified um, for the sector uh, in India, especially as it's nascent, it's growing, it's starting to now gather government support, it's starting to gather more industry support, more academic research as well, R&D uh, as well. Um, I'll start with Sarthak. Um, what do you see Sarthak looking ahead as the government's role to support the plant-based um, sector, particularly there's some challenges that you mentioned earlier that you faced. How can government lend support to industry, um, overcome some of these industry challenges and move ahead? Uh, so, basically, uh, what happens with uh, plant-based proteins or products that are you know, with plant-based proteins is transforming some uh, basic ingredients and more, let's say, textured uh, products or more acceptable products. Right? So in, in animal based uh, systems, essentially you're relying on animals to do that work. Uh, so at the end of the day, it ends up requiring a lot of investment and also energy or some some driver to transform the raw material to the finished product. Uh, so uh, from the CapEx side, uh, I think uh, the government has a lot of schemes like uh, the one I mentioned. Uh, the issue that I see with these schemes is uh, they are generally sort of fixed regardless of what project you set up. Uh, the quantum is, uh, uh, there's a generally a cap and if you just fulfill the basic criteria, let's say if you are, uh, so it doesn't take into account what's the risk uh, involved in the project, uh, how many players there are in the project, so what you're trying to do, uh, if you're trying to do something new, it doesn't incentivize that. So. Uh, a traditional industry would generally uh, be more in, uh, uh, would you utilize it more uh, because uh, the risk uh, becomes even lower. Uh, so I think that is one thing which would uh, help the industry or smart proteins as it's ramping up through a very high risk, uh, high risk phase. And uh, secondly, regarding the energy side, uh, uh, 
it, like if we look at our industry, uh, we a big cost is a variable cost is electricity. Uh, I'm sure there's different similar costs or different costs associated with fermentation. Maybe it's the cooling cost or you know temperature control and all that uh, stuff that's required. So uh, if there's more incentives, let's say in energy or electricity, then that would be very really useful. But I think there is uh, a lot of work that's happening directly, indirectly. Uh, so government is uh, also subsidizing solar, but there's also just a global trend towards the renewable energy. So I think that indirectly is a subsidy towards uh, smart proteins. So that's a that's a scheme or that's an incentive uh, not available to the animal industry uh, as much as it's available to the smart proteins. So I think that is some uh, a big thing in our in our field. Uh, lastly, like uh, I think in, when we talk about uh, processed foods, there is very less clarity on you know which product category they fit under. Uh, and this has been across the board, not just in uh, smart proteins. I think in, uh, this is a general industry problem, but in smart proteins, especially when you already uh, have higher capex, higher electricity cost, and you're competing against uh, subsidized annual agriculture, then uh, and you don't really, really recognize which uh, GST bracket you fit under, it's becomes very difficult to uh, you know compete with uh, that space. So I think this. Uh, Clarity on that and maybe parity with the animal based products would be very useful to the industry. Thank you, thank you, Sarthak. And I think these are all points of reflection so that these can be elevated to the right channels um, and those deliberations can be had with. Uh, different government departments we can we can encourage them to see the promise of this sector and try and bring more parity as you said across the board we know that there is positive signaling um, I uh, I don't know how many in the room have read about the news but re recently the Ministry of Science and Technology the Bi Department of Biotechnology released the bio e3 policy and smart protein is a pillar as a key area of focus of interest within that which is hugely optimistic for us uh, and we are we are trying to see how that can lead to the formation through biofoundries, shared infrastructure, and uh, hopefully working with allied sectors. If it is looking at environment, employment, all together, that collaboration work, that coalition building work, can happen in a in a more structured manner. So we're very enthusiastic and optimistic about what those next steps look like. Um, I know that a huge part of government policy also accompanies regulatory as well, especially when it comes to food grade uh, style of, uh, of the sector. So, um, Dr. Shukla, given your success with the FSSAI recently, as well as you're in the process with FDA and grass applications, um, what do you think the government can do um, to have better information out there? Um, how has it been helpful for you? What your learnings have been? Any recommendations, advice? Yeah. So. Uh as far as our understanding of uh, the regulatory approach is concerned, we uh, we had a very very, uh, very smooth run uh, with the regulatory agencies. And, uh, whatever they asked, we did those tests, and they were satisfied with the, way the kind of uh, you know approval that was required in moving ahead. So uh, my overall uh, see is that the regulatory agencies are keenly observing this case and they are trying to uh, develop uh, what you call the specifics to cater to regulatory uh, requirements. Being said that, uh, uh, you know, there may be some more communication efforts that can be facilitated. Maybe they are there, but maybe I'm not aware about Like, a, um, in our grass experience, we have a wheat grass, a 3F those kind of things. So that's what we're going through. They gave a list of certain tests that have to be done and then take it forward. So we, we are doing that. We did all that. Now we go back to the grass and that's how it will be. Uh, but uh, as the regulatory agencies have to be very keenly, you know, aware about the safety requirements and the things. And then the alternate protein is coming out. Uh, you know, some new proteins every time into the food chain. They have to be on their toes as far as what they are going to give it out to the society to be consumed. And that being said, uh, you know, maybe some framework or some uh, kind of structure comes out time and again that will help the, 
the startups and you know the people who are trying to approach them, that will help. That. So I feel that uh, apart from that piece, uh, you know, regulatory agencies are there uh, doing their job, and we we have to understand that the end of the day, however beautiful economics and feasibility and and you know good products, it has to satisfy all the criteria for safety in that moment. I, I just add on absolutely. To, uh, the reason why I'm just jumping the uh, pool is because being a former advisor of SSCI, uh, I know how things work at uh, a regulatory level. Through this forum, I would suggest like one of the, the key deliverables here should be that let SSCI have a scientific panel or a task force on alternate potentials. Absolutely. Because uh, what Dr. Shukla now says is the process of new product approvals. In fact, I've tried my best to be very honest with you <coughs> to smooth and ease on that. Uh, but still, there are hurdles. And there are a lot of trials which are required. And, you know, Reliance is, is a problem with a big name. But if it is to be done for the startups or new, or the person who is mentioning that it will be very, very difficult to launch a single product. But if you have a scientific panel or a task force, that makes your life much <coughs> simple. So I would request, Neha, whenever you jot down the points and the report is here, one of the points could be that let us have a scientific panel on alternate proteins. We already have 21 panels. There is no harm adding another one or two to them. Then we could have a panel even on uh, methyls and alkenes. Uh, in fact, this goes to the task force. We can have a task force, if not a panel. That also works independently. So what I normally happens is the, the, the recommendation of task force also goes to the scientific committee. And that is the way the recommendation of the scientific panel also reaches the scientific committee. So I think that will make our job much easier, provided we have done all the studies that are required on safety and quality aspects. Because when you go for a new product approval, all of you would have gone through that process. Because I know I was at, uh, you know, like, uh, I mean, people felt that you know, they were being left on the wrong side, but that was not the case. Because the, the regulatory requirements are so complex, even if you try to simplify them, it is easily not, it's really not possible. So, I think a panel or a task force, I would suggest let it, let it be a task force, not a panel to start with. And then slowly when the market grows up, there will be obviously more uh, things coming out, more, you know, more innovative products coming out, more creativity getting into the sector, we can even have a scientific panel. No, absolutely. And I think that kind of signaling from the FSSAI when there are panels set up, task force set up, to look at an emerging sector sends a very, very good message even to people who want to get into the space, whether it's researchers, whether it's uh, um, startups, whether it's even companies, established companies wanting to put new divisions in place for new products, you know, or, or their R&D teams, industry R&D teams wanting to look at this. So uh, definitely uh, we are making notes of these things, we've uh, got the GFI team here. Um, also I think there's been lots of uh, uh, popcorn conversation around collaboration. And I think there's all kinds of representatives in the room here from industry, from academia, from government. And I'll start off with Anand. Anand, what do you think are the government, academia, industry style collaborations that can help scale up plant protein? Um, what kind of a role can Paul play in facilitating this? How, how do you envisage this collaborative work to happen in action? Because I know you mentioned that earlier in the conversation as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll pivot the discussion again in two parts. One is that what we can do as a key stakeholder in this market and how can we collaborate with the, with the other stakeholders in the ecosystem. For us, uh, the protein is an absolutely you know, focused area and a key strategic uh, you know, market for us. What we have been doing is that you know, over the last couple of years, you know, we are building our capability to support uh, you know, this sector you know, uh, adding more, you know, experts into our team, scientists into our team, uh, enhancing our manufacturing capability, you know, completely looking to localize uh, some of the key process equipments to be more competitive, right? You know, which are some of the concerns in terms of the capex and our investments. Uh, and I would like to stress upon one point, you know, we are at the nascent stage and uh, the panelists mentioned about the challenges in scaling up. So we are building equipments, you know, which can start with, you know, 5 liter, 10 liter, 
and you know go on go on the scale in you know multiple liters. So we are looking at uh, not only linearity but also you know modularity of the system, right? You know linear. We always talk about linearity, you know, how linear scalability is. Now there is another element of modularity. Tomorrow, if you want to scale up, how modular is your equipment are? So we are also looking from that aspect in terms of you know modularity. Uh, so these are some of the internal aspect. Now we are absolutely happy to partner. Uh, you know we, we we strongly believe that you know. To have you know collective research, there should be an ecosystem of collaboration, right? And GFI is providing that kind of an ecosystem along with Mofti, Mofti. Uh, and we have been partnering with GFI for many of these initiatives. Now we we are also you know tying up with you know industry academic partnership where we can see that you know can we can we you know install our equipment in, in the academic space and you know so that you know the institutes can see you know how the different technologies are working. Uh, you create awareness in terms of the novel technologies, what is available in the space, and, and, and stuff like that, right? Uh, uh, and of course, you know, GFI is providing the top leadership to see that you know, how do we come together, and, and uh, as Dr. Roy mentioned, in terms of you know the, the regulatory aspect and you know uh, the task force and stuff like that. Now, what we personally feel is that you know we want to get into a phase where you know. Uh, we are able to provide off-the-shelf solution. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, to support the you know, manufacturers, you know, the time is of essence, right? You know, how how fast you can you know market your product is is critical for you. And and we are happy to do that kind of an internal uh, experiments or internal process development and uh, create a repository of of certain processes which is readily available and create an off-the-shelf. A solution. So you know, when we interact with uh, you know manufacturers, you know, okay, of course, you know, there are some nuances in terms of you know what is the ultimate end product look like. But at least there is a skeletal process which is available, which will help the speed to market in this process. So the opportunity is, is immense, and we are happy to collaborate uh, in this process. I agree and I think that consortia building approach, the ecosystem, firstly thank you for your kind words. Uh, we, we hope to continue doing this ecosystem building for smart protein in India. Um, that's the focus of our work at GFI India. We're very happy to collaborate with everybody on this panel who uh, has worked very closely with GFI India and, and provided such expert inputs along the way, expert advisory along the way. And I think that consortia building is very much of the essence. It's very much because on with a nascent sector, it's it's impossible for one person or one uh, segment of the stakeholder to kind of push forward. It does need people to come together. And touching upon what you've just said, what Dr. Oberoi just said as well, my next question is actually to Dr. Oberoi around academic institutions and their role, research institutions and their role in this process. Does it look like potential centers of excellence? Does it look like, how does it, uh, uh, in terms of tractable solutions, um, how do you see NIFTIM looking at this opportunity, leaning into smart protein, um, especially given the discussion we've just had today? Uh, if you ask me, like I think I have already developed a center of excellence in smart protein with all these gentlemen. For the simple reason that you know that they have been working in very diverse areas but coming together. Nifton has already initiated the process of establishing central excellence. We have a situation of this organization. Now there are companies, there are private companies who are willing to support us in establishing these centers. And I am open to having a center of excellence for smart coding for Nifton. And uh, would like to onboard all of you for that. Wherein we work on the R&D problems, we work on the solutions, we develop things together, we file joint patents, we have uh, common publications, and finally, we take it to a level where we are doing capacity building. So there, you know, it could be when you talk about smart proteins, we just thought about restrict ourselves to smart proteins, but the products which are converging on the smart proteins, the, the side stream uh, regularization, so, a smart center is required, and I think Nifton can be the best place to do that. One is because of strategic location, which we are just, uh, we are part of Delhi. Just located about three kilometers of Delhi border. Secondly, the area that we have 100 acres of land with you know, Dutch Green Campus and a few other We are blessed to have that. And so, already we have started this process of having centers of excellence 
with different uh, companies, different organizations. Like, you know, we, uh, we, we were talking to TCP yesterday for having one center of excellence to Medico for lipid sciences. So similarly, if there are people who wish to work with us, we are open to having this center. And I assure you that this center would come out with technologies which are world class and also will help ultimately eventually help in uh, you know, uh, reaching the cost economics which are required. As I said, we'll try different uh, biomass options that we have. We'll have uh, gradation based linear and modular fermentation uh, scalar processes. So that is quite doable. The only thing is uh, the idea has come into our, uh, all our minds. We just need to sit down, jot down together and work towards it. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And it's uh, very optimistic to see that if that's one of the takeaways is an action item from today's uh, today's conversation. Of course, funding and costs are always a critical point uh, for every new sector as they are emerging. We've, I think, earlier in the conversation tapped into uh, the fact that I know uh, Suraju said that it's not just VC funding but also public funding that needs to come in. Diverse financial instruments that, that need to support this space in different ways. Um, I think my last question to close this off is to you, Suraj, around strategies. As startups are um, finding it challenging, they are trying their best to push through with innovative ideas. Uh, but what can they do differently to attract more domestic capital, foreign capital, so that they can scale? And also, through this uh, journey, I know that there is an aspiration to have texture parity, taste parity, cost parity with conventional uh, um, animal-based products. So I know it's a big question to, to end up the conversation with, but yeah, any advice that you have? Yeah, I think um, maybe I'll just try and break down uh, this whole process of how uh, our investor is looking at these things, right? The first thing that uh, we require is clarity of the problem that we are trying to solve and I think it's everything sort of starts over there. I've always believed that, uh, you know, uh, in the good old saying that if, if you have one hour uh, to, to solve a problem, you should spend 55 minutes of that to actually understand the problem well and then solving for that becomes slightly easy. So my belief is that what we are seeing is that there are different types of problems. Right? So there are problems for um, you know, uh, nut so nutrition deficiency is a separate problem vis-a-vis -vis, you know, uh, building alternate proteins. Right? It's, it's a different customer base that we are targeting. Um, so the way to solve the problems are all different. So first, first things first, getting a very uh, deep understanding of what the problem, that, what's the problem that you're trying to solve and make sure that there's just one problem you're solving at a time. It's not like you're solving for multiple things at, at the same time. Second is that, you know, especially in smart proteins, uh, alternate proteins, I think we've seen for the first generation of companies come and, and get to whatever uh, stages that they've got. Whatever startups want to do now has to be uh, learnings from what happened in the first generation and make sure that we're not building a, a me too kind of a thing here, right? That's not what we require. Money will not flow into companies which, which don't innovate. Right, that's the bottom line. Right, so what we require is, if there are problems to be solved, and if there are like first generation companies which could not solve it, fair enough. But you got to find innovation over there. You got to find a new way, uh, in new technologies, new processes to solve for the, the challenge. Because the problems actually kind of remain the same. Right, just because the first generation companies couldn't solve it, there are reasons why they couldn't do it. There could be other challenges, and it, the depth comes from understanding why those uh, companies could not solve for it. And then you come up with your, uh, you know, ways, new, new technologies to uh, to come uh, to sort of solve for that. Take, you know, uh, from early 2000s, how uh, you know any uh, science has progressed. You know, you you look at uh, all the innovation that have happened, right? Uh, you know, especially in biomass and microbial kind of work. So much more information is available today around how my microbes uh, work, right? Uh, with new sequencing technologies, you've seen like so much of genomic information is out there, right? You know in and outs of how every microbe works today, right? Uh, even in plants, you have, you know, genomic data, so much of it is available today to figure out, okay, you know, uh, how do plants work, what are the different pathways, there's so much of new information out there today that startups need to start using that, uh, that uh, you know, information. 
started with to understand that that's the state of the art that we're talking about globally, right? And we, you have to start there, right? The idea is to build a state of the art, uh, you know, for technology, which could be globally acceptable. That's where venture capital money will flow in. And from there on, once you have the technology de-risking happening through venture capital money, eventually scale up uh, money uh, comes in. There's, there's enough scale up growth capital available, especially for the food, food sector, right? I think that's, there's no dearth of that. I think the challenge is to figure out uh, you know, new technologies that would be state of the art uh, and make sure that we are using all the knowledge that's available in, uh, in the world of science, in the world of uh, biology today to make sure that you know what we are developing is the next, genera next generation of technology, not like, like a Me Too product that you know, we are typically used to develop. No, thank you and I think there's lots of uh, students in the room hopefully who take away those ideas and, and the white spaces that have been identified through the conversation today. Uh, it's been very illuminating. I know we have probably ended with lots more uh, thought provoking, thought -provoking uh, questions and, and white spaces, but I think that's also critical in terms of moving the conversation together ahead. So um, we have about five minutes for uh, maybe one or two audience questions if there's a couple of questions to take. There's there's one gentleman there at the at the back. Hi. Hello. Uh, this is Tudwanj from the Entrepreneurship Cell of Hindu College and the Delhi Smart Protein Project. Uh, I I had a myriad of questions, but due to time constraints, I need to stick to one. I think one way uh, coming from a prominently arts college. One major field where we contribute to such projects is, is through marketing, and as we saw, where you talked about uh, integrating industry technology and the regulation, right? But uh, one major concern we face is that it's such an esoteric topic for the audience, right? The only thing we can do is probably do food testing, put up stalls, probably take them to the manufacturing centers if we, you know, collaborate that way, but. Are there any other ways in which we can make it more presentable to the audience? Do you have, um, like probably what Red Bull does is, right? They have so many uh, partners with them that let's say, because Red Bull has once uh, partnered with some gaming industry in the past, so what they do is, to pro showcase their Red Bull uh, product, they might set up gaming centers in colleges through which they attract people. So if the startups, and these huge companies like Paul Industries Alliance have past partners. Uh, what you can try doing is probably uh, when you collaborate with students like us, you can help us collaborate with them and like make the product more presentable. Because this is a huge problem that we've been facing since a very long time when we need to present the products further. So, is there anything we can do about this? Uh, probably. I think uh, the people can take this uh, from the marketing perspective, the branding and positioning. <laughs> totally not my uh, term. <laughs> uh, I get the sense where you want to take it, and um, uh, if I'm correct, you want to uh, integrate and energize, uh, you know, the customer to uh, the brand and the needs. If I'm correct. Oh yes, definitely. Right. So. Uh, that, that being said, uh, like Red Bull, again, I come to algae protein. And I would like to, uh, you know, uh, say that the end of the day, uh, the value that you're giving to the customer is of the paramount importance. And that has to be conveyed. Marketing will facilitate, or kind of these connections that marketing is trying to do will facilitate. But the overall consciousness around nutrition, in this case, uh, and uh, sustainability, that has to be connected to the customer, be it a college uh, student or um, uh, you know a chef somewhere. That has to be connected, and um, you know there are various tools in marketing. You will better understand. Uh, they have to be brought in to bring that connection and consciousness, and that's what I can say at this point of time. I just would like to add to it, 
uh, Red Bull might require so much of uh, energy to be pushed forward. Right? Whereas the protein, the plant protein, may not require that much, that much of energy. Because what is required, how they have to be planted is in terms of nutrition. Nobody knew about millets much, maybe four or five years back. Now everybody talks about millets now. So we'll see the light of the day very soon, we'll see the plant proteins with a little bit of uh, you know, information. It's, I think, all about dissemination of information. And social media is pretty good interest as well. So I think if we can all get together and push it through social media, to other resolution, we would not require so much of so many of the gaming challenges. We don't really, really require to invest in so much of money to push plant proteins as we require to push in those red bulls, make them real bulls. Thank you. If Thank I you, Dr. Yes. Uh, you know, this is, this is a very interesting and vast topic. So the, what, like any sector, you know, the marketing has to be a persona-based marketing approach, right? The protein as a product, you know, finds different application with different personas. If you are looking to market at a national level as a nutritional supplement, the marketing approach is different, the stakeholders are different. The same product, if you are looking for a consumer who is looking for a meat, uh, you know, plant-based protein for a meat alternative, the marketing is different, right? If you go to, you know, <coughs> youngsters like you, the marketing is different, right? You know, looking at the, what is the importance or relevance. So there is no one answer which fits all, right? It has to evolve, right? It has to evolve in terms of, you know, uh, a product and a persona and the marketing has to be devised. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a journey. Yeah, absolutely. We're a little, uh, we're pressed for time. Oh, Sathak. Yeah, we're pressed for time. Sorry, we do have to wrap. I've had little indicators telling me that we need to wrap. Uh, thank you so much for being a very present, engaged and, uh, 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 you know, audience. Uh, I hope that you've enjoyed listening to all of our panelists. But also, thank you so much, panelists, for bringing all your insights and expertise uh, and partnering with us uh, at World Food India. We at GFI India, very, very grateful. Thank you to Mofpi. Thank you to World Food India for having us here.